Mark Leahy. Uh, I am the chairman of the board of directors of the Churchill Club and a partner at Thunder and West. Our program this evening is called Executive Leadership and Business Performance. With us today or tonight are Bill Campbell, who is chairman of the board of directors of Intuit, and Gordy Davidson, who is chairman and a partner of mine at Fenwick and West. Uh, Dan Dennison, who is professor of management and organization, IMD and CEO of Denniston Consulting. Kevin, uh, pardon me, uh, Kevin Stewart, who is CEO of La Law Labs, and our moderator, Becky Turner. Uh, professor of Organizational Behavior or Psychology at the Marshall Goldsmith School of Management at Alliant International University. Uh, thank you all for being here. We also thank you Microsoft and uh, we appreciate their generosity in sharing their space with us tonight. Our sponsors for this program tonight are the California Psychology Association or CPA and the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology or PSYOP. Uh, we are certainly grateful for their support and partnership, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Briefly, he, here are two upcoming Churchill Club events. On Thursday, May 7, is the 2009 CIO agenda with Karina Terrell, CIO of Baxter, and Matt Carey, who is the CIO of Home Depot. They're flying in to speak with our members and guests about trends, strategies, and what keeps chief information officers up late at night. Leading consultant CIO Lars Robb will join them on the stage as well. Former Cisco CIO turned venture capitalist Pete Sulvik will moderate. Next, it's our most anticipated program of the year, our 11th annual top 10 tech trends on Wednesday, May 20th. This year, we have Vinod Koshla, Ram Sharam, Steve Jurvetson, Joe Schorndorf, and Ann Winblatt, who will be making the predictions about the most important trends for the year ahead. Uh, this is always a lively evening with high audience participation, and we hope to see you there. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the Churchill Club, uh, we, for the last 23 years, the Churchill Club has been the leading forum for the Bay Area business and technology community, presenting what's new, what's next, and what matters most. We're a nonprofit member-supported organization, so if you're not a member and enjoy what you see here tonight, I encourage you to uh, visit www.churchillclub.org, and you can learn more about us and sign up as a member or get on our mailing list. Now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, moderator, Becky Turner. As a professor of organizational psychology at MGSM, Becky's expertise is in leadership development, creating change in team dynamics and social influence in organizations. As head of Turner Consulting, her clients range from individuals and small organizations to Fortune 50 companies, and she has built a reputation for helping executives uh, solve the toughest of problems. Growing up in Virginia, she rode horses competitively and for fun, so early on she learned how to tame half-ton beasts and deal with piles of manure. So this, of course, helped prepare her for organizational psychology. So with that, I turn it over to Becky. Thanks so much. That was very creative. Um, there'll be lots of manure tonight, you said? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's great to be here at the Churchill Club, and thank you, Karen, and, and everybody, your team, for helping to put together this wonderful panel. Um, you know, we first, when we first began talking about this, we, we thought we'd call the program Top Minds and Bottom Lines, but I think in the end we decided we'd leave that up for debate. So to what extent do... <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it's begun. <laughs> to what extent do individual leaders really influence the bottom line, and how do they do it? From an outsider's perspective, Silicon Valley is known for having legendary leaders who are considered by the media and social commentators to be characters, often charismatic. Leaders such as Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, Carly Fiorina, and many others are widely known for their personalities, taste, and impact on the corporate culture. 
Also, there's the stereotype that Valley companies have people who are informal, intensely hardworking. We don't care where you work as long as you work all the time. Sometimes arrogant and impulsive, highly intelligent, and where brains count far more than maturity. Company reputations are sometimes inseparable from their visionary leaders, like the CEO is brand. While fortunes have been made at young ages, many leadership styles in the Valley really fly in the face of volumes of leadership theories and research on management practices. Let's take one example that everybody knows. Jim Collins talks about level five leadership, which is the paradoxical combination of personal humility plus, plus professional will. Yet financial success in the Valley doesn't really appear tied to level five, at least not the humility part. Or in the long run, is it? This evening, we'll grapple with the meaning of company culture and leadership and what difference do they make. Um, so tonight, we, our panel goes from uh, a one-year-old startup <laughs> to the biggest deal-making that happens in the Valley. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Bill Campbell, uh, who you know is chairman uh, of Intuit and the, their former CEO on Apple's board since 97. He's also been CEO of Claris and of Go Corporation, which Gordy said it's uh, go, going, and gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's my line. You've been stealing my lines. <laughs> Bill's known as uh, the coach of Silicon Valley for his counsel to Apple, Google, Kleiner Perkins, and many others. Eric Schmidt said that his contribution is literally not possible to overstate. I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> okay, he'll tell us. Former head football coach also at Columbia and chair of the board of trustees at Columbia. Um, Gordy Davidson is partner in the corporate group and chairman of Fenwick and West. Uh, he's been the lead counsel on over 100 M&As valued at more than $50 billion. He's named on Forbes mag magazine's Midas list as one of the top 100 venture capital deal makers every year since the list has been published. So there's a really broad view of what happens in the Valley. Um, also, there's Dan Dennison, uh, who's an organizational psychologist and a professor of management and organization at IMD in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, he's also a CEO of Dennison Consulting. Uh, the home office is in Ann Arbor. And he's former uh, professor at University of Michigan. He's done decades of research on uh, corporate culture, organizational culture, and leadership throughout the world. And he's consulted with leading corporations on M&As, turnarounds, and globalization. And Kevin Stewart. Kevin rhymes with Gavin. <laughs> um, Kevin is CEO of LOL Labs, or LOL App. We call it Law Labs, but Law yeah. Labs. Uh, well, there's some internal debate on that, actually. <laughs> My co-founder is sitting over there, so you can ask her. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I met her at dinner. <laughs> so I do know stuff. Awesome. <laughs> okay, they're a 2008 startup company, uh, considered uh, one of the hottest things going on. <laughs> uh, they are developing tools for users to create, personalize, and share customized apps on social networks. And unlike many things going on now, they're profitable and hiring. So. Uh, First thing, just to kick things off um, with Bill, I uh, wanted to invite each of you to briefly state what your positions are about the importance of leadership style and corporate culture on business performance. What's your bias? Well, I have a, uh, a very strong bias. I don't like to use the word leader. You know, my view is, is that if you take a look at the success successes in Silicon Valley, they come in all sizes, shapes, and forms. A consistent factor is that the leaders that you call leaders are good managers. And my view is we had, I had a human resources person years ago that told me that um, your title makes you manager, your people make you a leader. So I think we toss around that leadership um, mantra uh, too lightly. My view is, is that, that the people who are successful run their companies well. They have good processes. They make sure that their people are accountable. They know how to hire great people. Uh, and uh, <coughs> they pay them well. My view is that there's nobody in this room that, that if they really worked at it, couldn't be a CEO. I, I really believe that. 
but you have to have management practices to be able to do. How do you run staff meetings? How do you run operations reviews? How do you make sure that you are evaluating your people well and giving them feedback? At the end of the day, if they know that you care, then you can become a leader. Becky, I'm, I'd say, I agree basically with Bill, but I, I'd say that it depends on the stage of the company. Uh, you can see, you know, many examples. Silicon Valley is rich with examples of startup companies started by very charismatic, often very young, uh, inexperienced leaders, uh, CEOs if they're not yet leaders. Uh, and that works for a while, and some of them mature uh, into very successful managers and stewards of uh, enormous companies. Steve Jobs is a, is a great example of somebody who's – Larry Ellison, who, you know, and I, neither one of them had any formal training in any of the management disciplines. They learned it on the job, but they learned fast. Uh, so they were able to progress with the different stages of the company. But in, 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 in watching Silicon Valley for 35 years now, I mean, you see startup companies that start with one kind of a leader, then they uh, – find sometimes of necessity that they need a different kind of a, a leader for a period of time and then, you know, another and maybe another. Uh, so I, I think different talents for different times and different challenges. There's something you need special to be successful in Silicon Valley? I mean, is it different from other industries or geographical regions? Uh, you know, I think uh, it is and it isn't. I mean, it, uh, I think um, – the vision and the will to succeed are something that uh, probably exists in any, any company in any region, but it's special in Silicon Valley because I think you have to also suspend disbelief, right? You have to do something that somebody told you you couldn't do, uh, and uh, 20 or 30 venture capitalists said they wouldn't fund uh, before, you know, uh, before you can prove to the world that uh, your idea has actually got merit and that you're, you know, you know, you're going to prove everybody wrong and you're going to go ahead and build a company. When I came to Silicon Valley in, in 1983, um, a lot of the startups were hardware startups trying to build different phases, different types of personal computers, and they hired a lot of IBM sales reps to be salespeople, to be there, be CEOs, feeling that you know that was going to be the key. You know, over time, you recognize unless you understand innovation, know how to hire engineers that can address that, appreciate what they do, coach them as well, and make sure that that they know that you understand what they're doing and what they're going through. You can't be a CEO in Silicon Valley. You need to understand engineering. Can you move over to Dan? Sure. Um, the, I, I guess my perspective is that the people make the place. Um, that, I actually stole that, the title of an article from a friend and colleague of mine. The, um, you know, the people make the place. They create the organizations. The people create the technology. The people organize the funding. The people develop the, the markets. Any one given point in time, it's, uh, it's easy to forget that. But over the long haul, uh, that's one of the most distinctive things that a company can do is create a character, a personality that's unique to that, uh, to that company that distinguishes itself from the competitors. And... That's what I've done in my, um, you know, kind of academic career is tried to understand, you know, what's the link between this intangible culture that companies have and the, and the performance of the business. And you find that companies where the people know where they're going, uh, they're listening to the marketplace, uh, they're building uh, alignment and capability among their people, and they're building a platform around the core values uh, of the firm, uh, those are the ones that seem to perform the best. Um, is it different uh, in Silicon Valley? Um, a friend of mine that um, is from Chicago ran a company in Silicon Valley uh, for several years, and he said, yeah, his problem was always trying to explain to the guys in sh back in Chicago uh, how it was hard to project sales for the next year for this company, and they'd say, why? We can do it in all of our other businesses. And he'd say, well, it's because neither the products nor the markets exist today. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, that's, I think that's different about Silicon Valley. And it's always a pleasure to be here. 
Do you have a perspective on this, Kevin? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm not going to disagree with the wealth of experience up on the stage. I mean, you know, I'll go ahead. Here to why not everyone <laughs> else? <ahead. does. laughs> well, I'm here to learn from, you know, all these people. And uh, I would say, like, specifically, I can talk about, you know, what, what goes on at a smaller company and what I've seen. Um, and I would say that, you know, I think that it is important to have uh, a strong culture and, like, a belief in who your company is. Um, but obviously, like, it's, it's a small part of the equation that allows you to be successful. I think, as these guys pointed out, that, you know, good management practices and processes are definitely uh, something that are going to be much more important, uh, you know, to building your company. Uh, so. All right. Well, let's assume for the sake of argument that corporate culture does affect a company's success. I mean, I know that there is some cultural due diligence that occurs with mergers and acquisitions. Certainly people are concerned about this. How would you describe the spectrum of cultures, successful cultures, that you see in Silicon Valley? And anybody? I guess what I would say, just the companies that I know, is obviously we're all kind of like informal. We wear jeans. I'm probably like one of the few people who's in here with jeans right now. Uh, everyone kind of has a very casual attitude. There's no hierarchy. Um, you can go to anyone in the company and say, like, hey, look, you know, this is what I think of X, Y, and Z, so, you know, let's have a discussion. Um, I haven't found that in all the places that I've worked in the past. So your bet is that's going to translate into financial success in overall? Um, I think it's necessary in a small company. If you're not all on the same page at that stage, I have no idea how you're going to translate that into a, a larger organization. I think cultures take on the, the at the beginning, if you can watch, you know, what Steve Jobs did at Apple or Larry and Sergey did at, at, at Google, et cetera, you're, you're watching companies where Scott Cook did it into it. You know, companies take on the persona uh, of the founder. And, you know, it becomes that, that inherent is the culture. Not necessarily wearing jeans and T-shirts or not bringing dogs to work or, you know, those things are, you know, kind of a byproduct of, of attitudes that people in the company have and they're fine. But the culture, you know, is it a customer supportive culture? Is it an innovative culture? Is it a challenging culture? Think about, you know, the stories you hear about, you know, Bill Gates as, you know, as he started um, Microsoft. And over a period of time, if the, the founder stays involved, that culture becomes fairly durable as they bring in other managers to become CEO. Uh, it, you know, if they in fact do, Larry and Sergey as an example brought in Eric Schmidt. What he does is perpetuate what those guys really want to do. And it's wonderful to see uh, the innovation, dabbling in many fronts, giving people extra time to be able to work on things in, in, in their spare time that they feel passionately about. That kind of thing's been durable now for, for 10 years. And uh, this is something that comes up through, through uh, a founder. Now, how long can it last? I would say that. Intuit today is an old company. Brad Smith is the CEO. He's here in the company today. He perpetuates a culture that Scott Cook started many, many, many years ago. Vicky, Be I have a thesis that a CEO can't fundamentally change the, the culture of a company. Mm -hmm. A CEO can <coughs> change the energy level maybe and, and some of the effectiveness with which an organization does things. But, I mean, you see Hewlett Packard, for example, uh, there's a, so it, 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 I hope you all read the article in yesterday's New York Times. It's a great, great it's article, a great article about, yeah. about Mark Hurd and Hewlett Packard, and uh, and it, uh, you know the title is Hewlett Packard could use a little anarchy, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, that you know Mark Hurd has done a wonderful job of streamlining operations, reducing costs, uh, you know focusing on relevant markets, and and bringing a discipline there, but. You know, everybody I know who works at Hewlett Packard, you know, can, uh, and there's still a few who remember that they always remember the way Bill and Dave used to do it. And uh, th there's a culture there that, you know, Carly Fiorina could not move an inch. And, you know, there was almost, you know, a cl culture clash because of uh, Carly Fiorina. And so you have a history of, you know, the, the original, the proto prototypical Silicon Valley company started in a famous garage, you know, funded by, you know, doing the amplifiers for Walt Disney's Fantasia in 1939. And that somehow that culture persists uh, despite, you know, the uh, passing of the founders and the, the, uh, that, the very charismatic uh, leader in Carly Fiorina. And 
now a very operationally, you know, very efficient, uh, you know, a, a good good leader uh, in Mark Hurd. But I, the, the employees kind of still do it the old Hewlett Packard way, and uh, you know, I see that. I think you could say that about Yahoo. I think you probably say it about Intuit, Brad. I mean, it just uh, you know, there's something there that somehow you know has the DNA of the the founding of the company, yep. if not necessarily the founders. Well said. Great, um, great article. I I agree. And the um, if you went to the EDS <laughs> side of the organization, a lot of people would tell you. Um, a, a different but similar set of stories about the founder right. um, and about the traditions, and the uh, you know the merger makes great sense in terms of hardware, software, services, global scale, but you know it, it's made me scratch my head and think you know back and that if you had you know Dave Packard, Bill Hewlett, and Ross Perot um, <coughs> all in the room together. Uh, and you ask them to plan Ooh. for the 2020s, <laughs> what would happen? What would what would happen, and how how do you see that aspect of it? Well, I I, I think uh, first of all, another uh, uh, theorem I have is that uh, most mergers fail because of culture clash. So uh, the idea of merging EDS and HP is is frightening, and and I uh, the, you know it it may work. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but I think the cultures are very different, very, very different. And, and you know, Ross Perot is a you know, unique individual, too. Uh, but it's amazing to me, having done a whole bunch of mergers in, in Silicon Valley companies, that little things like whether the soft drinks are free or whether you have to pay a quarter for them, you know, the subsidized, the difference between a quarter and free often creates war uh, among the old guard and the new guard about, you know, <laughs> Do, do, does the management value the employees? I mean, it, it just little things. And, and, and more, more importantly, it, I think it comes down to what Kevin was saying before. It's, it's how the organization communicates with each other. And it may be by wearing jeans or it may just be by, by being open to suggestions. You know, does management listen to me? Do I make a difference here? The kinds of things that define great companies and are you know, measured in these best places to work surveys. Uh, th those are deeply rooted in the culture of the company, and as I say, you can't you can't stamp it out sometimes. And if the sodas are supposed to be free, they're supposed to be free. So then you would say that the soda thing is is definitely like an actual piece of the culture rather than like a window dressing thing. Yeah, it's an emblematic yeah. thing about you know do symbolic do, do people value you know my efforts, and I'm here at midnight, and you know I need a you know, jolt of caffeine to keep going, right. and I shouldn't have to fish around for a quarter in my pocket. Yeah, I mean, I hate to be political, but it's sort of like Guantanamo, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's going out there, but that's you know. going out there. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the pump that's panel, thing. right? So, <laughs> okay, so y th there's some discussion about um, that there are these things that are symbolic, meaning that it's it's not really the real thing. It's just how the culture is getting expressed, you know, genes and so on. So, so what is this? Deep thing called culture that we're talking about that you know can start in a garage and still exist in some way in a company that's around the world and gigantic company like HP. What is it? Yeah, what is it? Well, you know, I mean, every human group that survives over time learns some lessons, and the you know older you know ones teach the younger ones the lessons that they think. Are, are important and you know the best definitions are things like it's the way we do things uh, around here it's pretty intangible it can be about the sodas or the parking spots or what you wear um, but the um, uh, you know the my favorite definition uh, of culture is what we do when we think no one is watching uh, <laughs> So you know when there's when there's nobody you know watching you, the, that's when you really reflect, you know, the true values uh, that the organization uh, holds, and uh, you know this is like it's part symbolic, it's part about the structures, it's part about the systems that you uh, that you create. Um, hard to grasp, but you can definitely tell the difference when you move from um, from IBM to PwC. 
Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes in the um, IBM PwC uh, merger was that at the beginning, at one point, they convinced themselves that they were really like twins that were separated at birth and now, you know, reunited. Um, so they believed it and they didn't see the, the differences uh, so clearly when they put the, the deal together. But as you try to implement it, then you really see that the small things matter, the symbolic things matter. I, I worked with a company uh, years ago, one that Gordy eventually worked on too, is, is uh, when I first went there, they, they were more worried about you know, orange juice and bagels for breakfast than they were about you know, what the product looked like. Orange juice is good. <laughs> and orange juice was good. Yeah. And the orange juice and the bagels were great, but they didn't do anything else. You know, and so, <laughs> you, you, and, and so, you know, you, with all of that has to come a, a, you know, a high success factor so that you can associate the symbolism of having orange juice or free soda or bagels with a company that's prospering, that's doing well, that's well managed, that has the right behaviors in terms of energy in the company output in terms of, of products or marketing or sales programs, et cetera. And so y what you can't do is allow yourself to think that these, these things that you do are more important than the end result, which is these things become an, it should become enablers to a greater success, success of your company. But you know, I think it, uh, the culture is it starts with the values, uh, whether they're articulated in some, you know, mission statement, core values or not. Uh, it's uh, the kind of values that are exhibited by the behavior of the people who start the company and, and who perpetuate that culture. Uh, you know, the, there are the classic examples of HP again where uh, Dave and Bill didn't have offices, they had cubicles. And the first thing that Carly Fiorina did was she built a proper, you know, executive suite with wall, you know, wood panels and closing doors, and uh, like a grown-up company, uh, you might say. But it's, um, you know, wasn't wasn't the way people did it at HP, and that created some resentment in the in the uh, rank and file. Or, you know, probably more substantively, um, engineers are you know extraordinarily highly valued, as Bill said, in Silicon Valley and in Silicon Valley companies, beginning with HP. And uh, in some some companies, uh, you know, the, the salespeople or the marketing people are more highly valued, or, or uh, so, or the, maybe the finance. I mean, it's, it's a company where it's uh, managing portfolios of, of products or product lines, and it's you know do, doing the financial engineering. It's not doing the inventing. And clearly, in Silicon Valley, it's almost always doing the inventing that's valued, and that's part of the culture. And do the do the engineers uh, get some slack to, you know, uh, dress dress in an unconventional way, even if the CEO, you know, puts on an occasional tie to meet some occasional Wall Street investors? <laughs> Bill, I saw you shaking your head about that regarding Carly. I just, you know, my view is right now that, that, you know, the the symbolism of the open office is, you know, what can you say is. You know, managers have to want to listen to people, and if they're interested in feedback, uh, then the people feel valued. And if the people feel valued, they're going to want to work there. They don't give a shit of whether there's a closed office or an open office. You know, what they care about is, is how they're treated, what kind of work they do, are they listened to and respected, and all. That. And I worry so much all the time that. That you know these things become you know passed on from generation to generation. If you don't do it exactly the way it was done by, you know this guy you know 20 or 30 or 50 years ago, then you don't have the same culture. Th that's not the point. I mean, my, you have to understand that that go down into deep into you know the deep part of that. Why did Hewlett and Packard have no offices? Well, they wanted to communicate with their people, yeah. and so if they want to communicate with their people, they can find lots of ways to do that. And if, Carly Fiorina decides, I mean, I, I've watched companies that have open cubes and then the CEO spends his whole day in a, in a, in a conference room. So why didn't you just make an office? Other people want to use the conference room too. So, you know, I, you know these are, they, sometimes these become so crazily symbolic that they, you forget what the goal is. It's like the symptom, not the disease. Yeah. So, in M and A's, this seems—I mean, given that culture has been cited as being highly responsible for 
mergers not working a lot of the time and a lot of mergers don't work companies don't meet their financial goals within the first three years how is it then that you go about assessing a company's culture sometimes merge well uh, bill is the ultimate at this so he should he should comment but sometimes uh, mergers uh, arise because of common cultures I mean uh, I, I've seen a number of them where two companies that um, have known each other for a long time and say gee you know we you know uh, we have some kind of common values or common heritage or you know, maybe they work together at a prior company or something and their uh, strategies tend to converge they say gee uh, that's a company where we have a cultural match and you mentioned in other companies in the same business and other, you know, competing in the same products. Oh, that's a company, you know, we could never work for. Uh, and uh, I think um, mergers are often spawned because people know each other and know that there's a common culture. Uh, so, you know, it, uh, the merger happens because of the culture, not that you, you, you decided to do a merger and then you go find out whether there's a common culture. That, there's certainly deals like that and then it's a much tougher task because often they're done under time pressure and you have uh, sometimes as little as two weeks to do a merger of a public company if there's an auction. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe it's even two months, but uh, so you spend time with your counterparts uh, and you, uh, you know, may or may not know what the company, you know, what makes the company tick. I mean, one of the most striking examples of something that didn't work in my career, I'll omit the names to protect the guilty. Uh, the, uh, we had two companies, it was a merger of equals and, um, the CEO, after striking the deal, decided to go on vacation. It was the day after announcing the merger. Long, long scheduled vacation, needed a vacation, promised his wife he'd go. And he said uh, to uh, everybody else in the company, um, meet with your counterparts, the vice president of sales, meet with the vice president of sales, vice president of engineering, and so forth, and decide which one of you is the successor. <laughs> <laughs> It happens often. Right? I mean, this is a true story. You can't make this stuff up. And uh, so they all had breakfast uh, during the week the CEO was gone. And um, of course, you know, none of them resolved this question. But they resolved another question, which was they didn't want the CEO leading the company. Right. And it was a culture of engineers who kind of, you know, though some of them made some money, they still drove, uh, you know, five-year-old uh, Toyotas and they lived, you know, Spartan existences. Uh, and the CEO was one of those people who wore, you know, gold jewelry and, you know, had a limousine drive them to work and that sort of thing. And it was unanimous among everybody that the CEO had to go. And by the time he came back from vacation, <laughs> he was gone. <laughs> I had the pleasure of firing him with the chairman of the board. I mean, it was not pleasure, but I, I had the assignment. Of <laughs> firing. But it was uh, it was stunning. I mean, how, how many ways can you mismanage a merger right there? But it was clearly uh, the culture uh, clash. And they said, gee, you know, the CEO of the other company is really the better CEO, and they chose the other CEO. <laughs> well, I've, Great watched, example. I've watched so, so many of these. I, I, I wish... You know, I wish there were any. I wish there were two that were that were similar. I mean, the radical differences in culture, you could probably spot from miles away. You know, a place that's not innovative, or you know, because it has a harsh management structure, et cetera. You know, a top down, and and people are intimidated. I mean, those are easy to see. You can see those in a lot of ways. But you know, when uh, Gordy and I were involved in you know in the early stages of Intuit buying chips off. And you had one that was, you know, very collaborative and, and, and consensus oriented, and the other company was really top down. And not harsh management, but just top down. Everything was made by, by the managers and try to put the two companies together and, and devise a common belief set, not culture, but, you know, a certain belief set and how you were going to be managed allowed a culture which was a, a both sides of it had you know, enormous, part, enormous innovation, a lot of respect for one another. It was just a different management style. Mm -hmm. And I would say to you another, I mean, we have the founder of Homestead.com, which, which Intuit bought, and, and it was very different. They, the company with Justin Kitchen, his team brought, was something that Intuit really wanted at that particular point. So we wanted some of their DNA. 
and we got it. And that DNA is already infectious as part of the part of the company. So it doesn't mean it has to be the same. It has to be you have to understand how to evaluate it and then accommodate it and then make sure you make uh, uh, adjustments to make sure that that people understand what you're doing. Um, I mean, it's not simple, but but it, you know, it's very 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 workable. If you, you know, you can you can go out there and think about all the ones that you ran. I mean, if you, would you have said H, HP Compact was going to work? You know. Well, I know I know you're involved in assessment of culture, and uh, you know, if you can't have uh, Bill coach you, you don't you're not that lucky, and you and you don't get to be advised by Gordy. What can you do? <laughs> well, I think that the in managing the integration process, if you could clone Bill and Gordy um, so that they could manage integration top to bottom, um, front to back, around the world, that'd be the best of all possible worlds. But I imagine they would get pretty busy uh, doing that. I think one of the things that that we see a lot in uh, in mergers is where you need to do, uh, the, the initial work has to be intuitive. You've got to rely on the good uh, judgment. But as you try to scale up, particularly over a span of years, you you get a lot of leverage out of some kind of metric and some process to track the integration process because it happens in so many different places. Um, after having spent you know 10 years, uh, last 10 years, of my career working primarily um, in Europe, you see the interesting, most interesting collection of things you could imagine when you have, um, you know, two parties to a merger uh, between two American companies, and you're in the French subsidiary, or you're, uh, you know, you're in the UK, or you're in Australia. How do you man? And, and in one country, one party dominates, and in another country, the other one dominates, and uh, you know, I think that the uh, how you scale up um, and how you track uh, over quite a long period of time is is really important. The the uh, I think one of the challenges that some of the best and brightest leaders all around the world always have is that they think so fast and they're so intuitive that they're on to the the next one before the the detail integration <coughs> work around the world um, really, really sinks in uh, and takes. One of the mergers that we were involved in a lot uh, at IMD that uh, seemed to work well at the beginning, brilliant, you know, strategic merger was Daimler Chrysler. Um, but while the Americans were all singing, you know, the merger of equals, uh, we all are one, um, you know, the joke that was uh, around in, in Europe is, um, <coughs> do you know how you pronounce Daimler Chrysler in German? The Chrysler is silent. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and and that, it's, it's quite interesting because, uh, you know, a European business audience, you know, they'd sort of look at you and say, boy, don't you have any new jokes? That one's really old. Mm. But we never heard it here, okay? We never got it. Um, your integrity and your intent um, are, are probably the most critical ingredients because that was an interesting strategy because it was kind of a stealth uh, strategy which says we're not going to really do all the integration that we should at the beginning we want to let this play out over a year or two where our real intention will uh, emerge. Then should we move forward in this business, in this market, in this you know, segment, becomes a question that's on everybody's mind. And so you have to keep <clears throat> going back to the integrity of the people at the top and, and, and their intent. Because if you don't have that, uh, we're swimming upstream for the rest. Think about that. Four letter yeah. words are okay. I mean, no, but it's it, it's it's hard. I mean, it's, I, you know, I I don't think I I think that's you know positively right. I mean, how you know you can if if 
two people get together and, and ultimately one's in charge, then this person has to make sure that, that things work. And, and how do things work? I mean, I use the HP Compaq example, you know, as, as, as one. Did anybody believe that that would work? You know, you put, you put strong people in there that realized that they had to eliminate the, a lot of the duplicate functions, et cetera. I mean, it was, it was executed beautifully. It was done. I mean, take a look at, at Oracle and what they've done. I mean, they may have a harder time with this one than, th than they've had in others, but, you know, they have a good track record of having absorbed acquisitions. And it doesn't mean that there's no damage in there. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the, that the previous company's culture was able to be retained. It, it means that they ran the business very well and the overall culture of the company stayed intact. You know, I, I'm not quite sure. You know, I don't know a lot about, you know, Daimler Chrysler, but, you know, it's pretty obvious it didn't work. But, but, you know, I think you're right in that the integrity of the people involved, that they would tell you exactly what they thought the outcome was, should be, and they made sure that everybody in the company knew that, and then they all worked together to get there. That would have certainly made it a lot better. It seem, seems like a, a few people and maybe a couple of board members decided that they had a different outcome than the rest of the employees really thought was in, 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 the, in the floor. You know, the conventional wisdom uh, among M&A types is mergers of equals don't work. And uh, I think that's largely a function of culture. Uh, there's generally a dominant personality if there's <coughs> not a dominant, uh, and that can be a, a shared by several executives, not just one executive. But the, the dominant, you know, force uh, comes from one side or the other, and even a year later, two years later, five years later, people. <coughs> people are we still mic? I think that. Took are we on? Are we still mic? Yeah. Okay. okay. I think we uh, are. Yeah. No, okay. Now it sounds like we are. The uh, uh, even <laughs> five years later. Thank you. I just wanted to say that the guy up there thought we were pretty boring. He wanted to wake yeah. you guys up. <laughs> He thought you were about to oh. use a four-letter word, and he wanted to be preemptive. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a bleep. That was just a The uh, people remember which side they came from. Oh, he's from the Daimler side, or he's from the Chrysler side. Well, it's easier to remember in that case. But the uh, uh, it's it's remarkable how you know the, the dialogue will include. Oh well, you know he's he's from that side where they're not collaborative. Um, and Joe Chipsoft is probably the only merger of equals in my that I worked on that I could say is an unqualified success. Uh, and you still have mostly <coughs> Intuit people, not, not too many chip soft. I don't know if you have any chip soft people left. Uh, certainly not, uh, you know, not, not many if you do. But uh, uh, it's much easier to absorb smaller companies. I mean, Cisco is, you know, is you know, one of the best at it, and they have a very well orchestrated integration machine, and they plan the integration from day, you know, from day zero, basically. It's not after the merger closes, it's before the merger starts that they start figuring out about integration and, and how to integrate. And they tend to buy product lines and engineering teams as opposed to full management teams. Although where they have bought management teams, like Scientific Atlanta, uh, you know, they've kept it largely intact as a, as a standalone business. So they haven't tried to force two different businesses to, to, to uh, you know, integrate in a way that doesn't make any sense. Kevin, before we uh, move ahead to uh, sort of some closing comments and, and uh, Q&A, you know, it's rare that a person gets these three guys to consult with oh, yeah. on your company. Um, what's your biggest challenge, would you say, in either in the area of leadership or developing culture? Um, I think, you know, I've always been kind of curious, like especially – from Bill's perspective, like I know Intuit has had a very carefully crafted culture. Um, have you ever felt that there was like a mistake made along the way? Like did anything go wrong that you would, you know, in hindsight correct? Oh, for sure. You know, you, you know and the company's taken, you know, the company takes on personality of its management. And, you know, it's changed over time. You know, my, my view is, is that, um, when I was running the company, you know, we were a go-go company that was fairly messy. And, uh, you know, we then replaced that with some, something that was uh, very disciplined and operationally strong and, and lost some of the go-go stuff. And, you know, and, and so, you know, it, it's a hard thing to balance that. You take on, 
the company takes on a little bit of the personality of the, of the person that's in there. It never lost any of the Scott Cook DNA. But, you know, I think the thing that you have to constantly work on is, is you know, in your case right now, you want to keep this hottest company in Silicon Valley <laughs> title and while you're improving your operation and try to scale. Right. Better managers in place, better processes, better ways to evaluate your output, do things like that. And, and you know, in, in some cases, you know, at Intuit, uh, you know, we were, we were good at some things, not good at others, and other times they were, they were reversed. But overall, the company is kept on a pretty even track, and I do think that's because of the founder, and he's still, a, is still around and, and productive. Awesome. Yeah, I, I would I'd make the same, the same point, uh, maybe a little differently, but the um, keeping the same kind of, you know, dynamism and motivation and attractiveness mm -hmm. as an as a employer and as a career and as a future, while you get bigger, um, is, a, is a tough trick, a tough balancing act to pull off. I worked with an organization one time that, that tried so long and so hard to preserve that, you know, dynamic, you know, tight family environment that they got to 1,000 uh, people before they would have a, a, a level of management between the CEO and the operating level. Mm. So the organization evolved into a cue to the CEO's ear mm. and, and, and a lineup to try to influence him directly because they were really, they didn't want to take the step of creating the structure because they thought that would destroy mm -hmm. what they had. And the, the trick really is how do you scale and structure and, and preserve it? Because in the end, by not creating the, the structure, they did destroy it because it, it just changed because the organization was succeeding yeah, and was, it was growing. Yeah, you kind of got to evolve or die, huh? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Every six months, you know, and, and that can be a long time if right. for how you get the same dynamism at the next level. It's a tough trick. If, if you ever want to, I mean, if you, if you just go back and, and study Google and you just think about what they've done for the last 10 years, one of the most remarkable marches that you've ever seen a company make, that he, it has grown extraordinarily well. And it has not lost its innovative culture. It still has a... a a hiring and innovation machine, and it has done wonderful things with acquisitions that they've brought inside the company that have allowed new technologies to emerge inside the company that have turned into great products. At the same time, they've taken bigger acquisitions and kept them separate and allowed them to run like YouTube. And so, if you take a look at what, I mean, you just evaluate what they've done. You know, they've been able to scale while they've continued to have their innovation. They haven't had to trade off one for the other. It's a remarkable story. Okay, well, I think this is a good time to move to the Q&A. Yes? I'm delighted everything you said about merging culture. One, one sec, the mic is coming to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the light of everything that's been said about merging cultures, I'd be interested in what our guests think about the prospective merger between Microsoft and Yahoo. <laughs> Didn't know there was one. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, it, it was, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's hard for me to imagine that, that uh, you know, y y Yahoo fought off that, that uh, endeavor by Microsoft to, to, to buy them. I mean, it just seemed, from a value perspective, it just seemed like that was the wrong thing to do. As far as cultures go, I'm sure that they felt desperate that their culture would be ruined by Microsoft. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I watched uh, Microsoft absorb Tell Me. And if you talk to Mike McHugh, who's the CEO, uh, is, you know, today that they've given him all the autonomy he needs to be able to create great products and get them out the door. It seemed to me that Yahoo was afraid of something that, that maybe they shouldn't have been afraid of. Don't know. Yes, David. Uh, I believe D uh, Dan Dennison's re research has shown that uh, an emphasis on 
close alignment to the market and the capacity for change in the face of the market is one critical factor of culture that determines success. And Bill Campbell was at Kodak before 1990 when, as I understand it, there was a study done at Kodak about the potential of digital photography. Kodak's own study, I think, indicated that eventually digital would take over, yet they stayed with film technology after the market was moving. I'd be interested in your comparing notes on what that says about the culture, uh, adaptability to change, and particularly with Kodak as an example. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, adaptability is absolutely necessary, but that never means that it's easy. Um, and, you know, playing out a winning streak is not a bad idea. Uh, and I think that's the, um, that's the uh, dilemma that we all get in with successful uh, organizations. Sometimes, sometimes it takes com a rude shock for, for companies to, to see that change and to see that, uh, that difference. Um, I, had, I worked a lot with uh, Canon of the you know f uh, camera company copier company when uh, cam when cameras were starting to go into cell phones and that was beneath them sorry you know um, and the price point was pretty lousy i mean the tenders were 7 or 8 bucks a camera which to them was you know was was absurd but you know that was a real struggle for the the company and they still you know only have a very very few canon cameras um, in high-end cell phones, uh, even though now you sell fewer and fewer cameras because everybody takes pictures with their with their iPhone. Um, adaptability doesn't always happen, and it doesn't always happen as fast as we want it to. No matter you know, in in companies like Kodak, there were they had some they had some good people, but but overall, you know, my my story is always in the past has been when Lou Gerstner went to IBM. You know, he found a you know a fertile group of employees that really were the best and brightest that you could hire anywhere. They got to research the best coll colleges and got the best people to work there. That didn't happen at Kodak. Kodak hired you know sons and daughters of current employees, and you know they became stuck in the mud. So there wasn't a lot of innovation there. You know, at that particular time, they did have a, a foray into digital photography, and you know I I was there. I would had uh, I had film. But I, I can tell you this, that you know, from a customer-facing standpoint, when I went there, the first thing I did was Fuji had a sharper film. And I went over to the lab and I said to the guys, we need to have a sharper film. You just gave me a 200-speed film. You know, tell me what I'd do with that. This will give you an F extra stop. And I said, whoa, that's great. So Fuji's <laughs> kicking the crap out of us with, having, with the sharper film claim. He said, well, we could dive that emulsion back and make it sharper. I said, well, why don't you do that? It took me six weeks to get anybody to, to be able to do that, to dive the emulsion back so that we could get a better film, or at least a sharper film that we could make that claim against Fuji. The digital side, look, Kodak's, the film business there, with everything that they had, copiers and everything out there, 72 or 3 percent of that company's profitability was in, in Silver Halide. And there were people there, the old timers, that just wanted to keep it going, and they stopped paying attention to what the opportunity was in digital. And I was there during that during during that transition before I left for Kodak, uh, before I left for Apple. Another question. Speaking of having difficulty with innovation and transitions, um, what do you think of Detroit, of the U.S. auto industry? How much of their current difficulties do you think? are due to their corporate cultures as opposed to external economic conditions. Somebody want to take that question? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is anybody recording this? <laughs> I, I, I suppose I should since uh, my, my family's from the automobile business. Oh, yeah? uh, 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 and uh, it's uh, I mean, it's, I mean, here's another example, right? I mean, uh, GM had an electric car 10 years ago and, and literally killed it. Uh, it's an interesting documentary about that. Uh, you know, selling cars um, that people wanted, uh, SUVs and so forth, as opposed to cars that people needed uh, for the long term. And I think uh, 
I've seen uh, GM up close and personal. It's a very ingrained, slow-moving, you know, self-protecting organization. It's just hard to hard to move away from selling, you know, forty-four thousand dollar SUVs that get twelve miles to a gallon or making a lot of profit. Right. When somebody says, you know, oil's, uh, you know, not going to last, and the price of oil is going to go one hundred forty-five dollars a barrel or over even fifty, right? Um, it's just hard to convince people to make those changes, but uh, this is an extraordinarily painful time. Ob you know, you, you couldn't. It's, it's hard to overstate that one for for the for the automobile industry, and it's going to going to be very hard for it to recover. I'll give you a perspective that that you know, I grew up in, in in Pittsburgh. My dad was a steel worker, and uh, you know, to watch you know what had occurred with labor there. Over that time, and of course, there's no no mills and no steel in in, uh, in certainly in, in Pittsburgh anymore. And the unions gained so much power. Um, you know, uh, what what the unions were originally crafted for in those early days was to protect the worker. And then after a while, I, I'm I'm not sure what the goal was to try to get the most money out of management. And and look, I you know I'm a Pittsburgh guy. My father was a union man, but you know what the cost structure in Detroit cannot sustain that industry. And the cost structure is done by, by I mean, I, I guess there's been some labor, labor uh, agreements. It, it recently seemed like Chrysler got one. I, saw, I think I saw an announcement about that this morning. But you know, these, are, these are difficult times. I, there was nothing else to ask for when my dad worked there. And so what they got was a 26-week vacation every five years. Now think about that, half a year. And I mean that was, I mean they just had demands, 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 and and uh, <coughs> uh, management just buckled under, and gave it to them, and the cost structure went away, and they couldn't. I don't think they ever felt that anybody in a foreign country was ever going to take away that business. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that happened here. I'd uh, agree that a lot of it is uh, self-inflicted, and. Um, <coughs> in some ways, uh, you know, uh, inevitable and, and sad. You know, when I am working with uh, clients that are being, you know, especially difficult, no, no, no companies in the room, of course, uh, here, and, uh, and I've made all the examples, I've, I've made all the cases, um, I'm running out of bullets. Um, the last bullet is always to ask a client, who do you admire? And they sort of look around and think, well, ourselves. Uh, <laughs> who else <laughs> could we admire? Um, and it's really interesting because the companies that are the, in the toughest places where they're, you know, kind of a team going down together um, are the uh, hardest ones to get to see the examples that are out there that they can learn from. The most painful part of uh, the Detroit and uh, situation and American auto industry is that you go, you know, you get off the plane in Sao Paulo and you're riding into town and you say, well, that that small, you know, attractive car burning ethanol is actually a Chevy. Uh, it's a GM product. Uh, you go, you know, in uh, Germany and, uh, you know, a car, f you know, flies by you at 200K. I, you know, well, that's a Ford, um, and th they have um, in their corporate world the sources of innovation, um, and they try hard to change the core and the the center, but at least in this case, they've uh, in large part failed. Beautifully said. Great, right here. Um, you talked earlier about um, the Silicon Valley culture and the uniqueness of it, the engineering culture, and the role that the founders play in really creating that culture. And I'm interested in how you see that play out globally, because a lot of Silicon Valley com companies also gro grow through global expansion. So when that Silicon Valley company becomes a global company, how do you see that culture changing and transforming? Uh, let's see, the camera's still on. Um, <laughs> the yeah, actually, I'm going to take a 
the bathroom break. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's probably a good response to he, this. He, he liked that question. So yeah, that was a good question. You're going to take a run Thank you very much. I'll take one, too. Go ahead. The, I'll, the, I'll take one for the team next, then. The, um, I think that's one of the, the real challenges um, for s the Silicon Valley culture. Um, I don't want to name names, but the, I, I ran an executive program or two with a Silicon Valley uh, company at, uh, at IMD in the early part of the last decade, 2001, 2003. And they are still remembered, you know, as the Silicon Valley cowboys that you really had to be managed pretty carefully. Um, they, it wasn't a positive thing. They had some real difficulty with kind of the the way that, you know, uh, women in the Swiss Roman and the French-speaking part of Switzerland dress and behave. Um, and in general, they, you know, they were widely remembered for referring to the geographic regions of the world um, as the time zones. Okay, all right, so yeah, so I mean, if you're in South Africa and you're in Denmark, yeah, it's about the same thing, you know. It's, you know, GMT plus one, plus two, um, and the, uh, they, were, they were there to learn, and they did, you know, they did learn a lot. But I think that the world looks to you for, to this region for technology and for creative destruction and, you know, over and over again, and, uh, you know, six geeks, um, you know, all in, um, giving it everything they have to develop something new the world's never seen before. The world doesn't look to uh, Silicon Valley, or at least hasn't so far, for, for models of global uh, corporations. And, and one of my biggest um, frustrations, you know, my favorite toy and my favorite tool, you know, is my Apple iPhone. But this hardware software service thing the hardware software is brilliant but when you step over the border outside the united states my, my you know my favorite toy you know my iphone my favorite tool isn't a competitive product and it's not because anything that happened here other than the service deal that supports that and so, so I, you know I, I think that's a you know, and, and it's a very different thing from the dynamic innovation from the, the bottom up and the technology based. And, you know, you can't always have your cake uh, and, and eat it too. But like many great, you know, business centers around the world, sometimes it can be a little, you know, inward looking. I said I, that I pretty nicely, I guess. I don't know. I, I think the hardest. <laughs> no four letter word. If, if you're going to start a company, I mean, the hardest thing to do is, is to ex expand internationally and, and over a period of time grow globally. Um, I, I can't imagine there's anything harder. So, you know, you, you start off with a start off with a product that you try to make it a it, it universal product. You think about it right from the beginning. You know, you're going to do software in Unicode, or, you know, so that you can adapt it, et cetera. Uh, you know, and it, it's, it, it isn't, it just isn't simple. And then first thing you do is you try to get a product that's adaptable, and then you get... Uh, you put salespeople in, in various countries. A lot of times you use distributors if you've got hardware <laughs> products and you've got to go do it. I, you know, and then over a period of time you begin to put in your own, your own uh, operation, whether it's manufacturing offshore, whether you're doing your own software development offshore. I mean, it's, those are really, really hard things. How do you adjust your, your product for the country? Every time that you go in there, there are some products that have social adaptation in a, in a country and, and don't in other countries. You have to be aware of that. That means you have to hire people that understand that and do it. Look, it's very, very doable. I disagree with, with Dan on one thing. I think there is one company in the Valley that does it beautifully. I think HP does yeah. it very, very well. I agree. And, and uh, you know, I'm not sure there are, are a lot of others. I know IBM does it very well. They're not in the Valley here, but I think they've done a, a, g a great job with that. Microsoft has gone back and forth. Sometimes they've done development overseas, sometimes they bring it back over in over here. You know, you try to study them, it's, it's inconsistent in the way they've done it over the years. It's, it's a hard thing to do. It's a necessity. You've got to do it. There's great opportunity for you. Today, 
with the web, if you have a web product, it's a lot easier to do that. Right. When you think about how quickly Google has gotten themselves into international markets, it's because there's not nothing hardware. Right. No shrink wrap software, no disk to, 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 to sell. Totally agree with your comment about HP. I want somebody to ask a question where they disagree. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, there's one behind you and then... Or, oh, go ahead. You have the mic. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been talking a lot about the role of the CEO and leadership. And I wanted to uh, maybe challenge the group in, in a, a way in terms of looking at the role of the executive team uh, in this process. And I want to ask, um, there's been talk in academic circles at least about shared leadership in organizations. And is this something, is this something that's just a fiction? Is it a fairy tale or is it a real potential for this in terms of uh, the future, especially here in the Valley? I mean, now that I can concentrate again, <laughs> I'll come <laughs> on this. Uh, so, I mean, can I don't I know you how... some water? Yeah, please. <laughs> I, got, Bring it I, got here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know if this extends to larger companies. I'm sure, you know, other people on this panel would be better suited to comment on that. But uh, at our company, like, we definitely do try to uh, take into account, like, members of the management team's opinions uh, when we're making any important decision, um, even some relatively smaller ones, and we, you know, hang out a lot and like spend a lot of time together, so it doesn't really cost the company that much for us to spend time talking about those things. In fact, we just find it fun. Um, but you know, I'd be curious to hear what these guys say about what happens when the company gets larger. So, you know, my my view is that um, having a strong management team is crucial, and and understand you think about it now. You you know the. CEO is kind of omnibus. He's managing a lot of functions. And everybody that is managing a function on behalf of the CEO ought to be better at that function than the CEO is. So the CEO has to think that this group of people are very, very capable. And what he's going to try to do is get the best out of them. Some days you walk in, you want to hear about, you know, they're wearing their IT hat or wearing their engineering hat or wearing their marketing hat. Most of the time, you want them to wear their company hat so that you can get the best out of them overall is what you ought to do to run the company. These are all smart people that have great capability themselves, probably all of them, potential you know, future CEOs. And what you want to get is the best idea that comes from that group. You still, it's still your job to break ties. It's still your job to make the decision ultimately when all of them get together. But Believe me, you better have a strong manufacturing guy, strong IT, strong marketing, strong technology. I mean, you've got to have these kind of people in the room. You've got to rely on them. When it comes to the, a functional uh, decision, you're going to count on the person who has that functional expertise. You've got a company-wide one, you want everybody's point of view. I, I'd uh, add two things. Um, in observing companies where uh, it goes wrong is where the executive team is always trying to guess what the imperial CEO is thinking. <laughs> uh, and it's what I call the double fear factor. I mean, you're, you're afraid you're wrong, and you're afraid <laughs> that you haven't guessed what the CEO is thinking correctly, even if, the, regardless of whether the CEO is correct or not. And uh, that r really debilitates. I've seen many, many companies where that's been debilitating. Uh, so it's a fine line that the tiebreaker has to walk to enable the executive team to make decisions on their own, have confidence about speaking their mind, but ultimately being the tiebreaker. And, and you know, sometimes leadership just has to lead. It can't follow, right? So I mean, you, you've, you've got to you know, move people in a certain direction. So that, that's just one comment on, this, on technology companies. Um, I'm the chairman <laughs> of a law firm. And uh, that's the ultimate in shared leadership. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, as uh, somebody uh, once, uh, a, a university professor said, oh, you're sort of like the dean of the English department, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it's exactly right. I have a title and no power except <laughs> persuasion and trying to get a lot of independent actors to kind of go in the same general direction. Uh, so, uh, you know, you really have to, have, to, have to do it with the power of persuasion because it's not, you know, law firms not like the army. I can't order anybody to do anything. So how, how would a psychologist uh, answer that question about management teams? Well, probably not as well as those guys you know, <laughs> did. Uh, and I, I, you know, the, the, the discussion reminded me of working with a um, European uh, executive 
that came to the states to, to turn around the, the business unit in the states of the European corporation. It was his first assignment in an English-speaking uh, country, and it was really very challenging thing. Very strong, strong guy, um, and he had to make choices about who he was going to trust pretty quickly. In you know, you can't wait two years to decide. Well, you know, who am I going to trust? Um, six weeks, six months, that was the length of time that he took through intense, you know, interaction to decide who he was going to trust, who he was going to bet on as the team. And then, since he was not the great communicator, he was a fabulous communicator one-on-one, -on -one, very, very warm guy, very good guy, but he had to speak through his team. And that was where he really got the leverage, because people started to focus in um, did the action fit with you know the thoughts and the and the words? And there's no substitute uh, for a team at the top that has it together. And and I think there are a few things worse than um, you know what what starts to go on when you have a split team at the back and people are you know are at the top and are, are people are coming in every day to try to understand which way it's going to go, who to follow, who's going to be the winner, where should we go here. And you, you've got to manage that from the top. And they are cats running you know, every different direction in corporations, in English departments, or in, in law firms. And that's the prime responsibility at the top. Another question. Um, sorry, somebody has the mic ready. OK. How important have immigrants been in the leadership of Silicon Valley companies and how do you see this impacting corporate culture now and in the future? Do you Say again, question? how important is what then? How important have immigrants been in the leadership of Silicon Valley companies and how do you see this impacting corporate cultures now and in the future? <laughs> I, I saw a statistic the other day about uh, you know how many founders were uh, Founders of Silicon Valley companies were immigrants. I don't know whether it was a very high proportion. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley is a you know wonderful, a wonderful melting pot um, of the ultimate, in my view. Uh, just it, look, I mean, there couldn't be a better place to be. That's how I feel about it. I, I'm excited about it every day, and it's a meritocracy. It, it, you know, you feel like you can be as good as you 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 have the ability to be. Uh, I don't think you're constrained at all. When I was at Kodak or I was back in the East Coast, you know, I always felt like I was limited by my title and my grade and how many years I was there and what my experience was in that company. I don't feel that way at all here. I believe that that's why um, the, uh, uh, our, our immigrant workers are, are, are fantastic. I, I, I spoke at the uh, you know, uh, Thai conference, you know, the uh, Indian conference, and you know, it's just it's it's amazing to see the number of hugely successful entrepreneurs there are, as part of the organization. And and I mean, I you, you know, it's 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 at the point where you don't think about it very much. You know, you do when it comes to be HB1 visas. You know, you think about that a lot when you're trying to right. get better engineers into your in into your company. But uh, you know, as far as as uh, uh, you know, evaluating people, I mean, I. It's hard to say that that you even think about that issue. You know, you hire the best person, and it doesn't matter who, where they're from. I loved the um, uh, comment a few weeks back um, from an Indian journalist that said, um, "You know, recession, uh, financial crisis, you know, no problem. Just give an extra, you know, forty thousand H-1B visas to my countrymen." And they'll come here. They'll buy all of the houses that have been foreclosed. They'll work three jobs, 18 hours a day, and they'll make it work. I, I mean, there's no better example in the country of why we are still, in many ways, a, you know, a nation uh, of immigrants, and that, despite the hurdles of H-1B visas these days, still incredibly dynamic source of, of creativity. Yeah, I mean, to these guys' points. Um, out of the four co-founders in my company, uh, I'm the child of immigrants. Another one of my co-founders, uh, children, of a child of immigrants, and one of my co-founders is uh, an immigrant himself. Um, so, uh, 
question on you. Yeah. Yeah. In reference to culture is usually centered around the softer aspects, which is uh, very important. Is it uh, equally critical that uh, business performance objectives become integral to culture in terms of articulation and internalization across the company? <laughs> you heard me right from the beginning. I totally believe in that. I think that having you know, kind of a metric-driven organization has got to be part of what you do. And, you know, there has to be a way to evaluate your success or lack of. It's, it, it's a crucial part of what you do. Uh, you may have just answered my question, but I have a vested interest in, in having been in the change business for the last 25 years. And if I leave at this moment, I'll probably leave assuming that um, – Bill and Gordon don't believe you can actually change court culture, whereas uh, Neil and Caven probably do. And, and I, I'm, I, I may be wrong about that, but when you describe, Bill, the, the role of the leader really being a manager and managing processes and people and hiring and, and so on, um, I'm wondering if you would include culture with that and managing the culture and being very um, – diligent and measuring and taking the long view um, and you too Gordon whether you know during an M&A whether you have the same kind of attitude whether in fact you think you could fundamentally change the culture of an organization cultures can be changed uh, there's no question and I mean I, I I always hold out the one that I just uh, admired from afar which is watching what Gerstner did with IBM right it's, it's one of the most remarkable cultural changes I've, I've ever seen in, in business. He doesn't, still to this day, doesn't give enough credit for you know, what he'd done there in transforming that, co that company. You look, what you mostly want to do, when I, you know, I went to Apple in 1983, uh, you, you wanted that culture to remain. You know, I, mean, I came to Google in whatever the heck it was, you know, 10 years ago or nine years ago, a 201. I guess eight years ago. So you know, I, you don't want that culture to change. So your your job is to preserve it. Other cases, where if you don't like what it looks like, you've got to change it. And by changing it, it it isn't going to happen overnight. And if you have a global company, you got to change it in every office that you've got everywhere. And and what are those things that you want to change? Well, you're not innovative enough, or you're not disciplined enough, or you don't have a, enough of a sales culture, or you don't have enough of a Look, CEOs come in and they're paid to evaluate all that. When, if you have a realistic management team that you're sitting around with, they'll look at it and say, you know, we're not very good at this. We ought to try to change that. And then, you know, you make an effort, steps that you can take to, to, to make the changes. I'm not a believer that you can't change a culture. But, you know, what I saw at Intuit when I came there was an innovative and customer care culture that had been created by Scott Cook. I wanted it to stay, and I did my best to try to make sure that that part of it stayed. There were other things that we needed to make, that we needed to fix to make better. That kind of thing still exists today. I'm, I'm slightly on the other side, significantly on the other side of this, probably. As I said before, I, I, I think it's really hard to change a culture. I think it's possible to change effectiveness, and that may be different, and maybe you can apply some uh, metrics and some, some uh, rigor to the, the way an organization works. Because if a culture you know, it just means everybody's lackadaisical and you're never going to be a competitive company, then you know, that culture isn't going to survive. But I think that some of the core human values about how you treat people, how you communicate, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, how how you implement some some of the daily uh, you know, interactions, really hard to change. Really hard to change. It's, it's uh, you know they survive. Uh, certainly, in you know my organization and the you know hundreds of clients I've seen and in the institutions in Silicon Valley, there's still kind of a you know a way things get done. Uh, but a new leader can energize uh, and you know make m much more efficient and you know uh, and effective. Uh, but uh, I think you're going to have to work with the culture to do it. When you talk I about the DNA of a culture or of a company, are you talking about the culture? Pretty much the same idea. When you say the DNA, uh, you know, well, we may not be actually, which is a good question. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, I think some of the uh, there's something that's been consistent in Intuit since the beginning: customer-driven innovation. You call mm -hmm. it, uh, and you know, that comes from Scott Cook, and it comes from 
the necessity with which you know the, the company was born, and that that applies in a, in a lot of ways. And and uh, I think every leader at, at Intuit is always stuck to that that core principle, and, uh, and but it has brought different management styles to making the organization more effective. We've been uh, involved in a lot of culture change projects, and I but I do have to say that if you're batting 500 on uh, culture change projects, you're doing really well. I mean, if you're batting 250 or 300 on deliberate attempts to change and, and you know, reformulate uh, the culture of an organization, that's probably pretty good. I think it's actually sometimes more interesting to turn it around the other way and look at how much effort companies put into staying the same. Okay, we all show up at, you know, 7 a.m. and work, you know, our hearts out until 9 p.m. <coughs> to, you know, make sure nothing changes. Um, keep it on the same, you know, track that it's been uh, for the last, you know, 10, 10 years. Preserve it. Um, I think you see certain events, and we talked earlier about HP and, and EDS. One thing you can clearly say with that is both of those companies will be, will not be the same. They'll be profoundly uh, influenced by that. There's no uh, turning back. Um, one of the projects that we've started in the last uh, six months is with NASA, too, with Brian Adkins, friend and colleague, president. Can NASA change from a delivery organization back to its origins as an R&D company designing the next, you know, generation of, uh, of shuttles, that's the plan. And we'll see, because uh, it's easier said than done. We have time for one more question. This is a question for Kevin. So Kevin, you're running a, a young company that you co-founded and you've seen grow over the last year. Right. I'm curious, uh, during that time, what are some of the most surprising lessons that you've learned about leadership and about culture in your organization? Wow, where do I start? It seems like, I mean, like, when we first started, we were basically four people in a room just coding all hours a day. My co-founder is right there, and she's kind of like, yeah. It was <laughs> kind of ridiculous. Basically, like, we were in at all kinds of weird hours of the day. Like, we had zero planning whatsoever. It was just kind of like everyone knew what to do, and we didn't. We just, like, discussed it and argued until we agreed. Um, and now it's like, okay, there's all these people, so we now have to have a road map. And uh, I think I really learned the importance of, you know, like all that stuff that I didn't get like early on in my career. Like, oh crap, you actually, there is a reason that you have to plan things out. Like, you can't just, <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. it, was, it was mind boggling. Because, I mean, I'd worked on all these, you know, side projects, things like that. And, and at work, you know, uh, as an employee, like a lot of that got done for me, like in an easier way. I just had to like make estimates as an engineer or like a product manager. Um, but coordinating all these people, making sure that they have buy-in, uh, all those kinds of things, like were not things that um, came naturally. I think we had to spend a lot of conscious thought on those things. So, and I'm sure we'll have to do a lot more of that going forward. We're going to learn and run into plenty of new challenges. And I think, uh, you know, just evolving and trying to learn new things and not being intimidated by those things, I think is going to be uh, the key to our success. Oh, great questions. And um, I just want to give us a one minute to wrap up. If there's any sort of takeaway that anybody wants to finish up with before we let uh, Gordy go see the hockey game that's taped. <laughs> any well, I think it was away? great to learn from you know all you guys. and. Privileged to be a part of this panel. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kevin and Dan and Becky, Gordy and Bill, thank you very much. Thank you for your honest perspectives you shared with us tonight. Uh, as a small gesture of thanks, we're going to hand you a fine Churchill Club t-shirt. We hope you wear it at hockey games and elsewhere. Okay. <laughs> and I'd like again to thank Microsoft for hosting us tonight and CPA and PSYOP for their sponsorship. Thank uh, thanks for all of you for attending and have a good evening. Thank you.